Hi everyone, it's awesome to see you all here today. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, I've done a lot of things in this program. I've been making games, I've been making a lot of art, I've been reading papers, writing papers, and studying a bunch of different things. I'm going to focus on the studio work that I've made because I truly believe that one of my, where these two things come together are the influences from my academics and all the projects I do at Brown and how they come together to make my projects in the glass department. Because I truly think it's a, it's a process for me that comes from both schools rather than just one. Before anything, though, I'd like to thank a couple people. The people at the RISD Glass Department, Rachel Rorick, Sean Salstrom, and Jocelyn Prince. My support from, from Brown, Mary Armstrong, Michelle Zager, Han XL, and Ellen Rooney. And then my parents and family, my friends, and all my other loved ones who have helped me along the way. How big is the rain? This is a question I came up with last November. And using this question, I want to paint my narrative of where I got to my point, where I got to it in the present day. I'm, try I'm trying to understand how I've gotten to this question and what it means to me. I can better understand where I am right now. So this question is a little bit weird. It has a lot of answers. It could be the individual raindrops. It could be the cloud of rain in the distance. It could be the ripples on the water. It could be the rain that lands on you. And I'm not, well, I am interested in any answer that I get. It's the morphing of this question that really interests me. I, I came up with it while I was watching a rain cloud in the distance one day, and its, and its size struck me for the first time. I thought, oh wait, that's huge. And this question stuck with me for a while. And I, I think that by finding where, how, finding the through line through my work, I can identify where it came from and why it's important. But to go a long way back, one of my first glass projects, the Crab Bayani of her name, was a series of works that were a bunch of small glass casted crabs where I fused the form of crabs with everyday objects to give them quote unquote points or purposes, like a crab that could hold a phone or a crab that was also a flashlight. I made later a, a work called Buttered Pasta, a cooking vlog where I, after lockdown lessened enough to visit friends, I went to their house and we cooked variations on a nostalgic dish that I missed, Buttered Pasta. This work, Wireman Atlas, Wireman Atlas, came later at a class during came later during a class at Brown about the physical history of the internet. I created a technique using slumping, where when you melt glass just enough to change the shape, but not enough to completely dismorph it, to create an invisible body that was crushed by a black box, representing the bodies that our networks rely on, but are often invisible to us by the way they're marketed. All these three works in retrospect, are about ways of seeing the world without seeing. The, it's the way I see myself, not through a mirror, but through the food I eat. It's, a way I, it's about the way we see nature, not through literally looking at it, but through applying concepts of meaning or purposes. It's about the way we see our networks based off mar marketing, te marketing, marketing techniques and narratives that are built for us. My art, in retrospect, has always been about the way we see the world, and looking back, I think one work where it really, where it really came to me what ca came from a time when I was writing a paper. I was sitting in the Rock Library, and I sit in the same area every, almost every time I write a paper, and there is a balcony right next to me, covered in moss. And one time I was just getting distracted, looking outside onto the moss, and I was kind of struck by this macro ecosystem of the city of Providence right behind it. But because of perspective, it was the same scale to me as that tiny micro ecosystem right in front of me in the moss. And I was starting to think about how we saw nature. So I tried to look at this moss and try to take all I could from it. So I took the pattern it was in and it became one of my first projects about perception, which is my moss mirrors. I expanded, these, expanded this pattern into a large scale, turned it into mylar sheet mirrors and laid it out on the grass. I really love how this came out because it evokes a geographical map form. It looks like islands. It looks like a place. And when it comes from the moss, which is not really identif identifiable anymore. But, and this felt, this felt right. It was reminiscent of this, uh, man, um, this man-made ecosystem being the same size as this randomly occurring moss ecosystem in front of me. And I was starting to, starting to uh, scratch away at this topic. And I started to focus specifically on the way we use maps to see things, maps to see things that we wouldn't usually be able to see. I went back to some ref artists that I've always had as huge references to me. Now, Nina Kachadorian's moss maps, the link is quite clear here. 
She takes photos of moss that just happen to look like countries and then applies labels of them, labels on top of them to turn them into maps. And when I saw this and thought about my own moss maps, I was struck by how functionally similar this, these moss patches are to the actual maps. If I want to know what shape Australia is, both a hand-drawn map and this moss function the exact same. Now, Nam June Pike's TV Garden is a work that's been influencing me for over a decade. It's a large garden made out of potted plants and CRT televisions. And on first glance, there's this contrast between the nature of the plants and the construction, constructionness of the TVs. But as you look at it more and more, you realize that these plants are all put there. They wouldn't naturally be there. And in a lot of ways, they're as artificially placed and made as the TVs they sit next to. The line between man-made and, and, and man-made and natural is blurred. Both of these were really influential as I moved forward to thinking about how we sit, how we saw nature. My next project, Mappings, was a series of glass blocks where I melted a lot of glass with what's called frit, which is colored glass powder in between. As, they, as the glass melts and forms layers, they, they shift the frit into, into, like, into topogra topographical patterns, looking like landscapes, looking like maps of landscapes. But the only thing their maps are, are of are of the, are the glasses movements in the kiln, something that you cannot see. The same way we can't see a whole country at one time and we need a map, this is the same way that I'm mapping the motion of the glass. And, but this, this thought kind of got stuck here. I wasn't sure where to go on. And so I took a class at Brown last spring on Kazuo Ishiguro, a very, a very, very huge inspiration to me now. Specifically a book that I really enjoyed was Clara and the Sun, uh, where, where um, the main character and narrator from a first person is a robot that is powered by the sun. She is extremely deep in her own narratives of how she sees the world. She anthropomorphizes the sun to the point where she tries to solve problems through asking the sun to do things. And sorry for the spoilers, the ending of the book out of context is tragic, it's sad, it's hopeless. But in the context of the book, in the tone of the book, and this is my interpretation, so you can interpret differently, but I think it's a positive ending. She's comforted in her own narratives. Even though she's in this tragic time, she's able to be happy and feel good because of the narratives that she's constructed for herself. This made me think about narratives in this context of maps. How do the narratives recreate inform the way we see the natural world? How are narratives related to maps? I looked again at another artist. Pierre Hughes, Sp Hugh, Hugh, specifically his work After a Life Ahead. It's a large scale installation that uses a bunch of random natural elements that interact together. There's a snail that controls panels of the roof that let rain in, that make puddles, that algae grows in, that the bees eat, and et cetera, et cetera. All these random elements come together to create an ecosystem. And what is that familiar to? Random elements coming together to create a narrative. It was, I started thinking of ecosystems as narratives and, and in the same way, maps as narratives as well. Maps, ecosystems, narratives, they're all tools that allow us to see things that we can't see normally, whether it be because of scale, whether it be because they don't seem like they're connected, or whether it be because there's just so many interlocking parts that we can only understand them if we see them as a whole. Now, all these words for these ideas, I didn't have them at these points. I got them when I took a class for my senior seminar in MCM called Is That a Fact, which introduced me to the work of Lorraine Daston, specifically her paper on scientific observation, which I've reread dozens of times at this point, and I highly recommend. It's, it talks about this idea of all at once-ness. It's, it's an attribute of something that is, to be able to see the all at once-ness of something is to be able to take the details for granted. It's to be able to study something so deeply that you don't need to see those details anymore and you can just see the whole. The, a good example of this is botanical drawings. If a botanical drawing is of any one individual plant, it's not gonna tell you anything about the plant species as a whole. If it's of the all at once of the plant, you'll be able to account the var var variation and in individual elements of each individual plant. She uses an important example of the classification of clouds. It, uh, those are, the clouds are something that changes constantly. They're mutating, they're blurring and dissolving. So the only, and there's no one true like, model of a serocumulus cloud. But so we have to, each, each categorization of the cloud relies on the 
being able to grasp the all at onceness of it. And thinking about clouds and and maps got me. This is this is when I started to really realize that I wanted to make work about taking random events and putting them into the common sense and the, that natural thing we do as humans. And so my next work, last semester, my final project last semester was 1.1 million. I used that slumping technique I described earlier for Wireman Atlas to create a glass cloud that would sit over the viewer. I used misters above that to condense water onto it to make it rain. I framed the project to rain like a rain, cl rain, like a rain cloud, but not to literally try to imitate it via a rain cloud. I wasn't trying to tell anyone that I was putting a rain cloud in the room. I prepared, I also thought about what I had learned from Kazuo Ishiguro, where the context of the narrative really, really influences it. Before everyone walked in, I told everyone to come to Crit with waterproof clothes. I gave everyone rain jackets and before they were able to come see the work. And immediately we all approached the, approached the cloud, approached the piece with the narrative of a rain cloud. This is during the, build, during the idea building of this piece is when I came up with that question. As I said, I was watching a rain cloud in the distance when I came up with it. And I had been sitting outside trying to come up with an idea. I was stuck. I didn't know what to do. And then I saw this rain jacket in rain, rain cloud in the distance, and I reached for my rain jacket. And after reading the rain Daston recently, I had, I had, I had stopped. I took a moment to stop and look, and I realized that this huge thing in the distance was something that I was about to overcome functionally. It was something to be about to be something that I didn't have to worry about when I put my tiny sheet of plastic over my head. Something so large was reduced, was reduced to something so small, and this was a familiar sensation. It was the moss in the balcony earlier. It was the pasta dish that meant so much to me, but was so simple. And I realized that I wanted to create something that narrativized, that looked at how we narrativize the rain. I aimed to put the absurdity of this piece, of absurdity of putting a rain cloud, rain cloud indoors into the forefront without ruining this narrative. Rain clouds are huge and they weigh 1.1 million pounds of water but we still see them as things that we don't even need to think about. Like they just float above us without any thought. You don't even need to look up at the clouds to know there's a rain cut above you. You just know the sensation of it. And this isn't some groundbreaking idea. It's not something that I'm trying, it's not something that you're gonna be, oh, my world has changed, but it gave me the words and it gave me the way to process it that really made me understand what I wanted to make my art about. And so, as I moved into my thesis project, I wanted to continue this thread of how, examining how we view nature through narratives. And I returned to a process I made in the past that, want, that included the natural process within it. So the process which I'll describe, you take a, I take a, a flat sheet of glass and I float water on it just enough so it stays on top but doesn't overflow. I then sprinkle what's called frit, glass, as I said, glass colored powder, on top and it, and it floats. So it's light like algae. And as the water dries away, it carries that fret into patterns like puddles, like landscapes, like algae. And then using these patterns as inspiration, I create a mold out of fiberglass insulation. Using the shapes to determine where the peaks and valleys are, I have a mold that I can put the glass on top and eventually, and after putting it through the kiln, it slumps over and fuses to the, fuses the fret to the glass. I'll show you what the end result looks like in a moment. But in doing this process, I counted a problem that redefined how I saw it. Until now, until then, I'd been looking at the project as if I was setting the parameters for the glass and the water. I was trying to get it to do what it wanted in the way that I wanted. I'd been using, I'd been using a little jar of unlabeled fruit. It was sitting in the kiln room, and the color had worked the first time I did it, so I just stuck with it. And in retro, hindsight, it's 2020, but I didn't, I didn't think to check any of our frit to see if it also floated. When I ran out of it, I tried the other frit, and none of it floated. I couldn't find any frit that floated, and it was stressful. I was like, my thesis project is ruined. I, I, it, was, it was horrible. I, was, I tried changing the density of the water. I tried changing the way I put the frit on. I tried changing the surface of the water. None of it worked. And now what this holds is the frit that I created that worked. I didn't have to change anything. I had been, uh, I misunderstood where my hand was in the work. 
I had been trying to see it as me influencing nature rather than a dialogue with it. Rather than changing anything about the process, I had to ask something else for help. I had to ask wax for help, to make the frit hydrophobic, to allow it to flow on top of the water using surface tension. I felt like rather than setting parameters for the glass in the water, I had, felt, I had been set parameters by it. I had been put in my place and told that you do not control me and that we, it was something that we're collaborating on. Because of this, and because of this idea of my own idea, conception of the piece being muddled by its natural elements, I wanted to lean into this. And I decided to start growing duckweed, a, a water floating, a floating on water little plant that looks very similar to how the frit looks uh, when put next to it to try to confuse this narrative the same way that my own perception of the process was confused. The result of all this was from puddles from pools at all at once, my thesis project. All of the different parts of creating this piece were happening concurrently. I had to figure out why the frit wasn't working, fixing it, why the getting panels from, of glass from different places, making the molds, doing the duckweed at the same time. And as I became overwhelmed and immersed in it and thinking of nothing else, I found myself trying to find dialogue between all these different aspects of it. I was finding a discussion the same way that I tried to find a dialogue between the moss in front of me and the city behind it. The same way I tried to find dialogue between my own relationship with food and eating that I have trouble with and the dishes that I loved in the past, the same way that I saw the rain cloud in the distance and thought about my relationship with it. I was forced to try and turn all these random events in the piece's process into a common sense. I, I, and, I, and, and that was amazing. I wanted to create something that answered these questions of narrative, but most importantly, left it incomplete. I wanted, didn't want to give anyone a complete story. And I felt successful in this. I felt like I created a piece that modeled its own narrative specifically and especially in the material, material, sorry, materiality. People were constantly asking me what materials, what materials were what. I, I told, I had a, on the label, I had all the materials used. People didn't know which ones were where. Some people thought the duckweed was the colors that were on the glass. Some people thought the duckweed was the glass. Some people thought the glass was the duckweed. Some people thought the water was glass. Some people didn't even realize that the area underneath that was a reflection was, they thought it was a window and there was a second object underneath. And I'm not trying to put down anyone who did. I find that amazing. I find that trying to find your own narrative for the piece. I was turning landscapes into puddles, into clouds, into everything else. And that's hard to know exactly what's going on. It really felt like I had invented a process. No, sorry, I want to correct myself. I felt like I had mapped a process that was already existing. In trying to create a work, that was referencing the anthropomorphization and narrativization of nature, I ended up doing it myself. I ended up having this dialogue with it. And that was very satisfying. Now, how big is the rain? Might not seem super rated to this piece, but for me, it was understanding that the size of the rain, the processes of nature in the piece, were something that I didn't have a direct relationship with. That was one way, it was a two-way street. It's, it tells me things and I tell it things. Now, this is easy to say, but it's really difficult to internalize. And through doing so, I understood better how to create artwork that demands a narrativization while still referencing it. It helped me understand why I like glass, that rides between the line between unreal and real, hands-on and hands-off. And I felt successful the first time for really getting my academic influences through into the piece. When I was talking to people about it, they often told me about papers that reminded me of the, right, well, sorry, it often told, they often told me about papers that they read that reminded them, me of the piece that were similar to how I had already thought. This work was a mapping of all these different parts. The, my hand, the materials, natural elements, the list goes on and on, but it's not a map in the normal sense. It's a mapping that is incomplete and demands the viewer finishes it themselves. And I know this process a lot. And as I think about what it means to me in my journey here, I think back and all to all over my time. I think about finding the questions that define both my academic and artistic work around and how I find them through both schools. I think about the fact that I give myself a stronger framework to understand what I make and why I do it. I find a material that I enjoy and it prompts thought in me and, thought in me and hopefully the viewer. 
And I've given myself a lot of confidence, both in my ability to make and write, but also in myself. It's been, this program has been vital in my own struggle with anxiety and trying to get over that. I've been able to give myself a better understanding of how I see the world. And I've embraced seeing the patterns around me that no one else sees. Now, these are all things I think, though. If there's any one thing, if there is any one thing for certain, it's that I found everything in seeing the clouds. Thank you.